So you join us now and we are with Steve and your job is business support. Correct. Yes. Um, so I'm guessing if Greg is the glamour and the character of the business, you're the one who does all the thinking and working out how, how to move the business forward. Yeah, and trying to keep his feet on the ground. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can, I can see that being, being a challenge. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, you're kind of thinking, you know, you have to keep your eye on the really, really big picture. Which mm -hmm. is, and, and the thing is, if you're an MD or CEO of a company, you're, you're focusing a mixture on the micro side, management of staff and all that side, and the macro side, market forces and where you're going long term. But you are specifically kind of honed to that bigger picture. Yes, and it's about the balance between business as usual, maintaining and developing business as usual, as well as the kind of blue sky thinking about new markets, new products. You know, how do we keep, keep everyone happy? Mm -hmm. So you're optimising the day-to-day -day as well as sort of Indeed. tailoring yourself to go Thinking about the future, yes. Yeah. And one stat that I, I didn't know, I knew that you guys had, had a, a, a good sort of presence in Europe, um, but 70% 70% 70 70 of our sales go into Europe, mm -hmm. about 25% UK with 5% rest of the world. So it's, it's a really good thing, it kind of makes you feel a bit, bit good to be British really, when you've got <laughs> companies like that exporting, we're still succeeding. Um, and that brings up the big B question, um, what's your feeling about the, um, the little political thing that's, that's happening at the moment? Sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. The, the B uh, word. Oh, no, B, it's, it's, oh, it's like, oh, oh, oh sorry. Um, it's the uncertainty that's the real killer. Mm -hmm. um, I guess like many, many businesses, we've had lots of roundtable meetings where we've hypothesized about if this happens, this is what we could do. And we've kind of looked at, you know, should we set up a company in Europe? Should we set up a distrib you know, different distribution? But without knowing the answer, it's mm -hmm. very difficult to kind of agree a solution. It's sort of disaster plan and all the different routes. That yes, have, yeah. um, you, you know, in the scheme of things, we're still a relatively small business. So setting up an operation in Europe, um, you know, setting up warehousing in Europe is all very, very costly and could be damaging to our business if it wasn't necessary. Yeah. So it's the, it's the not knowing. You're well located though for export. We're in New Haven, as we've mentioned, which is, I've seen a massive great ferry and I'm guessing that goes to France. Uh, yes, several times as well, very frequently. Yes, brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Um, so in terms of working through it, you're also looking at what the customer of tomorrow will demand and how to access them. Yes. And you had some really interesting, we're talking really kind of macroeconomic now, um, but you're talking about how the, um, your current route to market, a lot of it, is through small independent shops on the high street. Yes. So you're talking about a lot of accounts, not necessarily high volume accounts on per account, um, and I'm guessing you act as a distributor as well. In the UK, those. yes, yes. I, so you've spoken to Greg about the formation of the business. Mm. You know, Greg views himself as you know a small businessman. He values very much the relationships he has with people. Uh, he's very appreciative of the support that he had from retailers and stockists mm -hmm. in the early days, and therefore, as a company, we place kind of high value on the support of our retailers going forward. It's a very traditional model, to be honest. It's, it's a model that has has proven the test of time for decades and decades. So, so yes, we have kind of gone down the route of many small relationships rather than signing up to big corporate relationships. Mm -hmm. That way we're able to kind of control and manage the relationship with mm. those stockists. And we're also able to be quite flexible um, with how we support stockists. Not necessarily always the best from a kind of business sense. To, well, quite to, to get lots of little orders. Lots of little and orders and little chasing, chasing money as well, quite often it's a bit of a pain. Um, well, we, we tended to manage that by, you know, we buck the trend slightly in as much as we tend not to offer credit. Okay. We look for prepayment for goods. Again, the philosophy being that we would rather spend our time, money and resources supporting the people who want to work with us rather than spend our time, money and effort on chasing those people who don't want to pay us. I think you'll find there are many manufacturers and suppliers who are terribly jealous of that policy because <laughs> I, think, I know it can be a bane within industry. You know, we support resellers from the point of view we don't have minimum orders, mm -hmm. um, we'll split cases for them. Um, you know, we will even offer to buy back stock if they've bought the stock that's not suitable for their customer and they want to change it for a different item or something. We'll buy it back at the price that they paid. Mm -hmm. So we feel that we're kind of very committed to supporting yeah. them. If they can't commit to paying us a few hundred pounds for a first order, then probably it's not a relationship that's kind of going to work. No, I think that's a very, very fair way of approaching it. And what do you feel to um, this thing that started up a while ago now called the internet? 
um, where you've got all these forums, like in, in the old days you had Detailing World, which obviously you've still got now, but you've also got the Facebook groups that have, have formed sort of snake pits. Um, how do you um, kind of view, because you, you do direct sales now. Uh, that's a re very recent development mm. for us. Uh, and predominantly that's come about, really I think, for the reasons you're suggesting, that we felt slightly uh, isolated from the end consumer. Mm. Um, we were relying very much on those independent stockists and independent resellers, if you like, to be experts in our product and promote mm. our products. Um, but to be fair, many of them stock lots of different brands. Mm -hmm. It's quite a tall ask for them to be kind of experts in all Everything. the features yeah. of our products as long as everyone else is. Um, and we just felt that actually we could help them by better promoting our products to mm -hmm. the end consumer. Um, our marketing has always been spent on, if you like, brand and product awareness mm -hmm. with a view to driving people to our to stock channels. Yeah. Um, but if people don't necessarily know enough about the features of the product or how to use the product, um, they aren't necessarily, we, you know, we're not helping our resellers sell them. That's what you mean. Yeah. Um, so if we now engage a little more closely with the end consumer, um, we can educate them on the features and benefits of the product, we can help them with their technical um, queries that they may have, you know, in-use queries, dilution rates and those kind of things. Do you find customers are getting a bit smarter? I've, I've noticed in terms of the questions that we get is that in, in olden days, you know, a shampoo is a shampoo, but nowadays we get people who obviously know quite a lot already calling up um, and saying, oh, I want a pH neutral shampoo that's not going to affect my LSP. And yes. 10 years ago, somebody just went, I want shampoo to clean car, you know. Yes. Um, but there is that kind of old adi adage about a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Indeed. Yeah. Um, well. and, and we get lots of people who have heard phrases like that mm. but don't necessarily know what it means or quite what they're asking for. Yes. Um, you know, all of us have been very kind of hands on with car care. Um, you know, I'm fortunate now to be working here with Greg. I've known Greg for about 10 years. And really, we got friendly because of my passion and enthusiasm for cars, and predominantly kind of keeping cars clean. You're a BMW person, though, aren't you? Uh, I worked at BMW Car Club for a while. And okay. um, I'm glad that um, Greg mentioned Audi. Because <laughs> I, I drive an Audi, so. Oh, so well, perfect, well, yeah. well. <laughs> Um, but prior to that, I prepared cars for Concours um, oh, wow. in, in Volkswagens, Porsche. Um, so I've just always kind of been interested in that. In, in cars in, and in, car care? In cars and car cleaning, yes. Mm. Um, I'd say that's kind of how I got to know Greg. Over the last 10 years, Greg's sent me various products to test and try and what mm -hmm. do I think of them. Um, so we've kind of stayed in touch, i say very hands-on with the products. So I'm very kind of able to talk to people mm -hmm. about the products, talk to stockists about why they're not I, I think that's products. really important. I think in a lot of uh, sort of fast-moving consumer goods and in other industries, and you phone up a sport line and you very much feel like they're reading through a script. And I'm not just thinking about sort of internet stuff, but it's very much like they've got what, you know, what they've said is on a piece of paper in front of them, not from hands-on experience. And yeah. I know when you're talking to somebody who knows about car care, they'll give you tips and tricks that aren't on the back of the label yes. and aren't on some corporately approved sort of how-to guide. Yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, and really, Greg's development of the products came from his early days as a Valentor, where he wanted products that helped him do his job. Yes. So the products were designed from the bottom up you know, with a problem in mind, how do I solve that? Exactly. That's the kind of ethos that has worked its way through the products. And, you know, I do speak to people, people will get in touch with me either because they've seen my contact details on the website or they might have picked up a card at a show or an mm -hmm. event, and they'll ask me some obscure questions. If I don't know the answer, I've got kind of two or three, including Greg, real um, positive, you know, points of contact. Mm -hmm. Greg knows the cleaning solutions to most things. If he doesn't, there's Josh. Mm -hmm. So Josh, as a chemist, knows exactly what's in all of the products, knows how they'll react with various yeah, you know, contaminants and yeah. surfaces. And then we've got Elliot, who's our detailer, you know, and what he doesn't know about finishing paint and all sorts of things that, that's not really worth knowing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. And in terms of accessing the market, we've talked about how small business, it's not, you know, you're, I'm sure you will keep supporting those guys and helping them oh, through. Absolutely. But as our high streets die, slowed in tragically, um, it's a matter of finding other avenues. And we've talked about the directs. What about to trade? 
because you're very strong, certainly speaking with my PBD hat on, a lot of our guys use your products, particularly for the wash and decon stages. Yes. And BD Marvellous has also got a very strong position as well. I think it's kind of, it's, it's a development of, if you look at, say, Colonite, which is, again, a traditional reliable wax from a very established company, I, I see that kind of Alapro is almost like they're kind of taking over that mantle with BD Marvellous. Um, do you offer, obviously, direct sales to trade, but... We do, again, very recent development in the last matter of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I've kind of experienced over the last 18 months of going out and talking to retailers is we've got a very comprehensive product mm -hmm. range. Um, and I go and talk to retailers. Initially, I was concerned at the lack of name recognition and awareness for Ballet Pro. There was, you know, a few weeks kind of, if I made the right choice, you know, coming mm -hmm. out working here. But you then very quickly realise that it's actually an advantage because the story is very good. You know, we've got a 15 year pedigree, a really mm -hmm. broad product range. Um, so actually the fact that people haven't heard of us isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's far better than I stopped it five years ago and I couldn't sell it or it's too expensive or blah, 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 blah. So it's a really good place to start from. Um, until now, trade inquiries have been passed to our stockists. Yeah. One of the challenges that we have is we have hundreds of stockists across the UK. Um, not many of them are full stockists. Okay. So it's quite yeah. difficult without kind of accessing an accounts package and seeing, well, what stock has this person got? So we can look them up and say, oh, you know, you're based in Bristol, XYZ, stock yeah. our product. We don't actually know which of our products they've got on the shelf. Well, also in volume, of course, because you guys do some bigger volumes as well. Um, Up to five litres at the moment. Yeah. Most, most of our products are available in 500 mil, one litres and five litres. Which for trade is essential. And that's the thing, if you're a little retail shop designed for the home user, you're not going to want to have you know, 50 products and then five different sizes of bottles for each product because then you'd need a warehouse of your own. So, so we have previously looked at 25 litres. Mm -hmm. um, 25 litre containers pose some shipping and distribution issues and we're not sure of the demand for them. Mm. So one of the benefits are, again, of um, serving the end consumer, particularly on the trade side, is we'll have a much better idea for the volumes and quantities of product that they want to buy. Mm -hmm. And that may lead us then to bringing in certain products, like you say, the decontamination products in 25 litre sizes, which of course would also be available to our retailers to mm. sell as well. I, I think that'd be a really good idea. I mean, knowing, again, if you're a full-time mobile balloter, you go through product quickly. And uh, even if you've got really concentrated product, you're diluting down, you go down through it quickly. And that's why Autosmart have been so successful, because they've got the model with the vans going to places, and they're big vans as well, yeah, yeah. and they can take all that weight. Whereas if you want to do it um, from different manufacturers at present, your best bet really is to fill a pallet with 25 litre products. Well, that, that, that's the problem we face at the moment. A retailer who orders several boxes of five litres and two 25 litres, it's very difficult to stack a pallet. Yes. Uh, which is why you know the decision for many years has been, well, we'll stick it in five litre sizes. Mm -hmm. If you want 25 litres, just buy five, five litres, <laughs> yes. Um, but we, we're going back to the, the kind of product range, mm. um, and I say, we go to motor factors, um, they're keen to get on board with Valet Pro, and then it's a little bit like rabbit in headlights when they see the product range, because they yeah. just don't really know, you know which products to take which is partly where I can then talk to them about their customer base and what, what sort of customers do they have and we, I can help funnel it down. We're just going to produce a slightly simplified uh, selection of products for the trade. So when we get a trade inquiry, we can say, this is a range of products mm -hmm. that we'll present to you um, and provided you're a bona fide trader with a kind of company registration and mm -hmm. a business premises, you know, we're happy to talk to you about supplying you with trade products. And it, are you thinking of tweaking formulas? I mean, if you look at, say, Autogem and stuff like that, a lot of their products have got trade-only ones that are in different containers, and sometimes they're very similar to retail, sometimes they're a little different. Um, at the moment, no plans to do that. As we get closer to our customers and understand, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what they want and how they want to buy it, you know, the benefit of having Josh on yeah. board. You can tweak it. Um, yeah. You know, the thing that we have to try and do, and I guess partly my mindset, you know, prior to getting excited about cars, I spent 25 years in financial services. 
um, uh, working as in kind of business development, process re-engineering, Six Sigma. So I'm kind of quite super dead. exciting oh, at dinner parties. Oh, um, <laughs> that's why I never mention it. <laughs> um, the um, but it's kind of quite data driven. Yes. So what we need, to, you know, my, you know, part of my you role. You just want to fill out a big spreadsheet, don't you? So you can do some statistical analysis on it and then come up with a nice empirical answer. But it is important <laughs> yes. because you know we we have you know we're passionate about what we do mm -hmm. and we get very excited about trying to please people. But th the danger is that you get kind of too many distractions. Yes. So partly what I can you know can bring to the party to the is day. that just because one person wants a pink product rather than a blue product doesn't mean everything really, should be changed to pink. It, yeah. in, indeed. You know, let's let's build that into the way we analyse the market. When we start seeing that there's a trend and there's a need for it, then we can kind of have those conversations. Mm -hmm. So sure, we could have a trade range. It may not be necessary, and it may just further complicate the and size of the yeah. product range, the manufacturing, the labelling. You know, we export to 32 countries. Mm. Um, so, and as you you kind of observed when you were walking around, lots of different labels. Mm. We really don't want to run two ranges with two different. If we don't need to, yeah. And equally, the, the trade when it comes to doing twenty five litre stuff, shipping abroad, is gets even more complicated than it does yeah. here. And certainly, if you're looking, I mean, you're saying five percent of the rest of the world. I imagine you're wanting to increase that. Um, and if you try and ship to America or the Far East with some, some sort of exciting chemicals that might go a little bit bang if, if they're not treated properly, yeah. it's, it's a lot of paperwork to cope with that. Yes. Um, but then by the sound of it, paperwork's kind of exciting. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favourite macro? Uh, uh, don't ask that, we'll talk about it later. Um, so that's kind of an exciting challenge, isn't it? And so you've been here 18 months. Yes. And you're still as driven as you were the day you arrived? Oh, very much so, yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's, it's, um, it's kind of rewarding to see the kind of added structure. We have a monthly management team meeting. We all have kind of input into those meetings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, over the last 18 months, it's kind of moved from being a one-man business into a kind of management team-led yeah. business. Um, you know, we, we've got a committed five-year business plan that we're all signed up to um, and you know I say we're reviewing the reviewing progress against the plan month by month um, so yeah future's bright cool cool and the future's white <laughs> <laughs> um, so, well, anyway, thank you very much for your time. Okay, um, we are going to continue to adventure around the Valet Pro facility. I've decided to call it a facility. It's about big enough to be a facility. Um, and we'll see how all the other different ways that it operates and how it sticks together. Fantastic. Cheers. <laughs>